in the last part we have seen an increase in the dislocation density increases a shear stress to move the dislocations so in this part we will see how this dislocation density increases or why this dislocation density increases but before looking into that we will see how these dislocations nucleate first in a material so there are several reasons and the first or the major reason is a solidification or cooling down from high temperatures so we know that when you cool down from high temperatures there will be a creation of high local internal stresses and these local internal stresses is generated because of thermal gradients let's say if you have a large volume of a material which you solidify or cool down from high temperature so the each part or a portion of this material will cool down at a different cooling rate and thus creates a thermal stresses or thermal gradients which in turn creates an internal stresses or thermal stresses and this is a reason for formation of dislocations or another reason is a change in composition so how this happens so this also happens during solidification so let's say a case here copper nickel phase diagram i have shown and let's say here there is a line which is shown for 35 weight percent of nickel and let's say from liquid to solid how the transformation occurs you can see that in liquid there is a 35 weight percent of nickel so when it starts solidifying you can see that what is alpha formed here is corresponding to 46 weight percent of nickel now at this location c here the alpha has 43 percent of nickel and here you can see at point D you have alpha has 35% of nickel and at point E it is alpha which is again a 35% of nickel. So you can see that as uh, this liquid is solidifying the alpha which is a solid which is forming out of this liquid has a different percentage of nickel and thus this change in composition will create or causes a change in lattice parameter and this change in lattice parameters will result in a nucleation of dislocations the third reason is a change in crystal structure you can see this kind of scenario occurring when there are phase transformations so a common example is gamma iron is transforming to alpha iron where you have volume increase and this volume increase will lead to formation of dislocations Similarly, you can say that a gamma iron, when I quench it, it forms martensite and there is a large volume change. And this large volume change will cause a large increase in dislocation density. And these are the several reasons by which the dislocations can form. Another reason is we know that there are vacancies which are thermally equilibrium defect. So you have equilibrium concentration of vacancies at a given temperature. Now let's consider for FCC materials like aluminium, you have quenched in vacancies. So when I quench aluminium from high temperature, these vacancies will remain at even at a room temperature. So we have high concentration of vacancies at high temperature and when, when I quench it suddenly, these vacancies do not reduce or they, they remain in a high concentration even at room temperature because of the quenching. And these vacancies, they will accumulate on high atomic density planes and because of this there will be a creation of strain and this causes a formation of vacancy loops and these vacancy loops we have already seen such as this loop here is nothing but a prismatic loop which has formed so this kind of prismatic loop forms during quenching of FCC materials these are the several reasons by which dislocation, dislocations nucleate now let's look at why increase in a dislocation density when there is a plastic deformation we'll try to address it so before that let's look at this scenario which poses this question why there is an increase in a dislocation density so we have a dislocation here we have seen that and in an when you apply a shear stress this dislocation move and it comes out and forms a step and this step we know as a burgess vector and now you can see that the rest of the crystal is a dislocation free so when dislocation is coming out on the surface and it's disappearing there is no dislocation left inside now when i increase a deformation why there is an increase in the dislocation is a question as this dislocation is coming out and disappearing 
So here, because of this scenario, the dislocation density must decrease. But what we see is that when I increase a plastic strain, there is an increase in a dislocation density. Also, we have seen this, this relation where there is an increase in the dislocation density, there is an increase in shear stress, that is a strain hardening. So we have seen that practically also there is a strain hardening where there is an increase in the plastic strain and a dislocation density. So because of these two reasons, one is saying that the dislocation density must decrease when there is a plastic deformation and dislocation density must increase when there is a continuous plastic deformation. And we have seen that the dislocation density increases because tau c is also increases which supports this increase in the dislocation density. Frank and Reed in 1950, they independently come up with a thought that there must be a dislocation sources which causes increase in a dislocation density. So they proposed an existence of sources of dislocation inside the crystal which operate during plastic deformation. And these sources of dislocation results in an increase in the dislocation density. So Frank and Reed, they made in a conference and come up with this idea of dislocation sources and now these sources are called as frank rate sources. Now let's look at what are frank rate sources. So let's consider this crystal where you have a slip plane and a dislocation line and this is a glide plane for this dislocation. Let's mark this axis also and this dislocation is pinned at these two points A and B and how it is pinned so you can say that there are two planes on which a dislocation line is lying but however this line the dislocation cannot move on these planes so let's consider a Burgess vector the Burgess vector remains invariant for a given dislocation so it will direct towards one particular direction and its magnitude remains same for a given dislocation so you can see that for this complete dislocation you have only one Burgess vector and dislocation line vector it will let's say this is an H uh, dislocation so you can say that dislocation line vector is here perpendicular to the Burgess vector or along the dislocation line so the dislocation line vector will move along this dislocation line so this is a dislocation line vector or a tangent vector and let's say you apply a shear stress tau on this surface which is parallel to this glide plane. Now this shear stress is not acting on these two planes which are marked with the blue. So this dislocation or uh, this dislocation segment will not move on this, these planes and only a dislocation segment which is pinned at A and pinned between A and B will move uh, under the influence of the shear stress. And thus we can say that this dislocation segment is pinned between A and B rather these dislocations which are marked with blue will not move under the influence of the shear stress. Now let's consider this scenario, this uh, glide plane. I have marked a Burgess vector and a tangent vector and this dislocation line segment A and B. Now let's consider the length of this dislocation line segment to be L and you have a force acting on this dislocation line segment which is given as tau into B. So we have a force acting on this dislocation line segment as tau b and under this influence of force this dislocation will bend which we have seen. So to make this dislocation cur curvy you have this tau which acts on this dislocation which makes this dislocation curvy. The, the force acting on this dislocation will be perpendicular to its position or at tangent vectors and we can find out what is this tau which comes out we have already seen that to maintain this curvature let's say here the radius of curvature be r and you can see that the tau which is required to maintain this curvature is given by alpha gb upon r we have already de derived this relation when we de discussed about dislocation tension and now when i further increase this tau which makes this dislocation line segment in a semicircular way and the Burgess vector will be pointing towards one direction which is already shown here. So Burgess vector remain invariant 
and the radius of curvature decreases to r and the, this radius of curvature will be given by l by 2. So the distance between a and b is l. So this radius will decrease when this dislocation becomes semicircular and the radius will be given by l by 2. And for this radius, what will be the tau? So we can use this relation tau and find out what is tau required to maintain this semicircular nature of this dislocation segment. So it is given by, so here for r in place of r, I replace l by 2 and it, it is given by tau equal to 2 alpha gb upon l. Now this I call it as tau c and that is a critical shear stress to maintain this configuration, semicircular configuration. Now when I increase the tau which acts and the force will act on this dislocation line and increase its curvature. So what, what is what will happen is that you can see that these are two points A and B. This dislocation starts moving, moving in this direction. So you can say that in this case the R is greater than L by 2 and thus the tau required for causing this bowing of dislocation will be less than tau critical. So you can say that when I apply a tau C or when dislocation segment makes this curvature which is a semicircle fashion, I don't need an extra stress for bowing of this dislocation. So when I apply a tau C which is a critical shear stress to maintain this semicircular nature of this dislocation line segment, I don't need further increase in stress for bowing of this dislocation. So this dislocation will start bowing because there will be force acting on this dislocation line segment at every point which is perpendicular to every point at this dislocation line segment. And thus this tau is less than tau c and this dislocation will start bowing by itself under the shear stress which is tau c. So you can see that when I, when I mention a dislocation line segment, I, I maintain a line segment or a tangent vector. Let us mark that. So let's mark a tangent vector and the tangent vector here, you can see that it is going in this way. Let's say from A to B we are considering. So here also we will consider from A to B. This is a tangent vector which I'm marking with a blue and there is a bowing of this dislocation. So now if I mark this tangent vector, let's mark this. So this bowing remains unstable. So you can see that because you don't need an extra shear stress for this bowing, this configuration remains unstable and it completes the bowing. So you can see now at this location, here, let's mark it here. So you have a Burgess vector. You have a Burgess vector marking in this direction. For it remains invariant for a dislocation. So at this location, you can see that this is a tangent vector. This is a tangent vector, and the Burgess vector is in this direction. So for this configuration at this location, you can see that this dislocation line segment are having a screw nature but of opposite signs. So let's consider this is a positive screw, so this will be a negative screw and these two dislocation line segment will attract each other and when they attract each other in a such a way that when they meet each other, they will annihilate each other. So we have seen an annihilation of this location in previous part. And in this case, these dislocations will attract and annihilate each other. And they annihilate and form a loop. So the bowing of this location will continue. And here they form a loop. And again, there remains a dislocation line segment, which is pinned at point A and B. And now this dislocation line segment can again move uh, under the influence of stress and form another loop and these loops are nothing but the sources of dislocations. So this process continues 
and generates more and more dislocation loops inside a crystal. So let's let me write it here. So here again there will be a tau which is applied and this will cause moving of this dislocation loop again and again it will form again it will form another loop here in this fashion and this loop will this so these two points or these dislocation points will act as a dislocation source this is nothing but a frank rate source which operates in a material now let's look at this simulation over here so you can see here that this dislocation loops are forming and again it tries to form another loop in a material so this is how the loops will be forming in a material which acts as a source of dislocations and this source is called as a frank rate source here there is a frank rate source in a silicon crystal this is a tm image for uh, showing or demonstrating a frank rate source operating in a silicon crystal now there is another way by which this frank rate source can operate so there is another way which is a cross slip of a dislocation that is formation of frank rate source you can see that we have discussed about cross slip of a screw dislocation so let me write it down so we have this screw dislocation so you have slip occurring over here and there here is a cross slip and here is double cross slip and you can see that these points a and b which acts as a pinning points for this dislocation and under the influence of stress they form a loop and these loops will continue to form under the influence of the shear stress and these loops acts as a dislocation sources and this is one mechanism by which frank grid source operate in a material so we have seen how the dislocation sources operate in a material and these sources are called as a frank grid source with this i will stop here